to get to the other side. You said it's a base. Good morning, everyone. Um, while we're still getting ready, um, please just greet each other. Say hi to each other, one another. You can give uh, each other a pat. Reach across. Shake each other's hands. Let me just highlight a couple announcements here, okay, before we begin the service. Um, first of all, please continue to pray for our youth pastor search. Um, we, we talked about this many times, just continue to pray for God's wisdom. Please also pray for our list of repairs, uh, church building repairs. We'll probably be talking about this a little bit during um, our members meeting. So I encourage you to all come and attend our members meeting. We will be doing one important thing we will be doing for this members meeting is we will be voting on the budget. So the budget is actually available downstairs. Um, it's at least on the bulletin board. I think it might be in the back. Anyone know for sure? Okay. We got three deacons here and no one knows for sure, but um, the, it's, our budget is available. So please, um, if you're interested, uh, please ask me or Mike, or Gloria, or Paul for a copy. Um, and we can provide that for you. And if you have any questions, please ask us. Um, we will have the members meeting on November 5th after the combined service. So that service will start at 9.30 in the morning. We're shooting to finish with the service by 11 o'clock. And right away from, right away we will go from um, that members meeting um, we'll finish, we're shooting to finish at noon. So that's the plan. Um, so please, um, if, you're, if you have any questions, um, because of the time constraints, if you have any questions, if you can ask the budget questions ahead of time, that would be great. Um, you can ask us, or if you would like, you can email the questions ahead of the time um, to our church secretary at office.cccm. Gmail, I'm sorry, at eatgmail.com. Um, please pray for our uh, elder, John Wang, um, who's not officially serving as elder currently, but he is preaching at the Chinese church in Rock, I think it's supposed to be Rockford, Illinois. Um, and Elder Fushong, who's at the New Life Chinese Church in Appleton this coming Sunday. Um, those are all the announcements that we have here today. Could we all um, stand up? Let's uh, read our passage here from Isaiah chapter four, one to six. I apologize, I got Isaiah six. Let's read this together. Prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. 
In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst, by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion, over the, her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night, for of all the glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day, and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank you that you are that shelter from the rain and from the storm. Father, we thank you too that you are the one who is perfecting your church. That we one day we will be the bride of Christ, holy and blameless and without reproach. And Father, as for your people now, as we come to worship you, Lord, may you draw our hearts to you and help us to cast aside everything, all the encumbrance that takes our attention away from Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to praise you and worship you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon you, Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon you, Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon you, Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon you, Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the God, the everlasting God, you do not faint, you won't grow weary, you're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on ways like Comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like a man in the very nature of God 
pierced for our iniquities as you hung upon the cross. But God exalted you to the highest place and gave to you the right to bear the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus we should bow. And every tongue confess that you are Lord. will shine upon the earth and rival thrones will fall before the Lord of all and hell's supreme authority in the true and living God that at the name of Jesus we should bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord and when you come in glory for the world to see, we will say, Hail to the King. In all His splendor, Please be seated. Let's pray together our, for our time of confession. Father God, we thank you so much for the glorious privilege you have given to us to see that your son Jesus is high and exalted above every name. And Lord, you have drawn us close to you and to your son and that we can see all the blessing that he has done in our lives, the forgiveness that we have received, the justification that we have from you declaring us not guilty, the presence of your spirit in our lives, changing us and molding us to be like Jesus. And yet, Lord, we come before you right now. We want to confess to you that even with all these great blessings, the greatest blessings that you have given to us, we have made so very little use of these blessings in our lives. Instead of exalting your son Jesus, Lord, we have run after other gods of our own likings. And we want to confess our sins before you and confess to you that we have now worshipped you and we have placed other gods before you. Lord, whether those gods are the gods of idols of our own selves, our images that display itself through our 
constant feeding of social media, or whether it is our addiction to our pleasure, or going to websites we should have no business with the name Christian to go, or whether it's our filling our imaginations with our own pride, and loving ourselves, or coveting, or murmuring, or complaining, us of complaining with all the blessings you've given to us that the little physical things that we did not receive. We want to come before you now and confess our sins, and we know we have many. So please hear us now, Lord, as we confess our sins. Lord, we come before you and we take the wonderful words of your promise through your Apostle Paul who says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present yourself, present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Father, thank you so much that we can be beyond reproach and to be holy and blameless. What a wonderful gift, blessing you have given to us. And we thank you for this wonderful gospel promise. And as we live this week, would your spirit help us to live in a way even more pleasing to him? Thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand up? Please listen as I read from our passage this morning. This is taken from Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leper, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. This is God's word. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
Lord, I stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and town. We are your people, redeemed by your blood, rescued from death by your love. There are no words good enough to thank you. There are no words to express my praise. But I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand every time, every trial. Every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Lord, we stand by grace in your presence, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We are your children called by your name humbly we bow and we pray release your power to work in us and through us till we are changed to be more like you then all the nations will see your glory worship you hallelujah 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 to the lamb hallelujah hallelujah by the blood of christ we stand every tongue every tribe every people every land giving glory giving honor praise unto the Lamb of God, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Please have a seat. for a word of prayer please let's pray father god we thank you again so much that even though we don't deserve this at all and we even though we are like the farthest away from you even though we run as much as we can from you and our our sins, our actions are odious in your sight. Lord, you have selected us as your precious people that we can actually one day gather before your throne to sing the wonderful praise of the Lamb of God. Oh, Father, we thank you, and we just pray that you would prepare our hearts more and more right now in this life to praise the Lamb. Father, we just pray that you would please help us in our life at this time as we live as your servants in this world to praise the Lamb. For some of us, Lord, there may be difficulties, health-related issues. Give us strength. We pray for Leanne, we pray for Wilda, 
We pray for many others. Sometimes it's just as we get older and we need your grace, please help us. And for others, others of us, Lord, we need correction from your word. Please give us a humble heart. For others of us, Lord, in the trials we face, trying to find our job, of trying to decide our vocation, trying to find our vocation, trying to provide for our families. Lord, would you please give us grace as well and help us in the midst of this to be able to see and to sing hallelujah to the Lamb. And that as you call your church, as we see in Revelation, you call her in the wilderness and you provide it for her, that we could see in our wilderness that you provide for us. And we pray for our church too. That our church will be a church that upholds your word. That our elders, our pastors, who practice church discipline. We'll come before you and handle your word, handle the sacraments, the ordinances with fear and trembling, with joy, gladness of heart, and yet with reverence. Father, we just thank you for all that you're doing. And we pray, Lord, that for our church, that we would grow in our love for you. And we pray for that because, Father, we have talks about our church relocation. And this may be an issue at our members meeting. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would direct our steps. Show us where you want us to go to serve you. And Father, we pray for the budget. We pray, Lord, that the money we spend in our church may be used to glorify you. Father, our hearts are not just with what's happening in our church walls. Our heart is also for this world. We just want to first lift up, continue to lift up the many families in Israel who have lost loved ones who have been gunned down by terrorists, many who have lost uh, children and wives. Father, we pray that you will give them comfort and that they will find the true Messiah, who is Jesus, your son. And Father, we also just pray as Israel is preparing to strike into Gaza, we pray for the protection of civilians, Lord. Um, that they will be allowed to be evacuated. Her terror stories of Hamas using them as shields. Lord, we pray that this would not be, that you would protect the civilians on both sides and that you would bring the wicked man to justice. Father, and I pray that For, our, for the just government, just use of your power among government in our land around the world. Father, you give the sword to the government that fear may be due you. We see so little fear of you today. So we pray for our leaders, for our president down, that they would use their authority given to them rightly for the blessing of people and especially your people. And Father, as we open your word now, Lord, would you please show us what you want your church to, to do in the midst of this world that has turned its back so much on you. Lord, we may see ourselves as little, 
as of having little strength. But may we hear the praise that you give to the church of Philadelphia when you said that, I know your deeds. I know where you live. You have but very little strength, but you have been faithful to me. Behold, I set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. Father, may we know your open door to us, that we may be faithful in spreading the gospel of your glorious Son. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can you please stand up? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer, and afterwards, we'll recite the Apostles' Creed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffering the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Today we're going to talk about the devil's helper. How the devil needed desperate help for his, for his desire to overcome the church. You know, we might not appreciate how powerless the devil actually is. You know, and, and last, last week, I've, you know, I talk about it, but oftentimes we talk about this in theory. But this week, as I was sitting on the plane, coming back from Virginia after visiting my two daughters, wonderful daughters, I came across, I thought about um, Colossians 1. I'm still memorizing Colossians, and I encourage you to also continue to uh, memorize God's Word. Colossians 1, 22 says this, and although 21, yeah, 21, although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, and engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now brought you near Ah, yet he has now reconciled you in this fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and without reproach. Do you guys hear this? It doesn't matter who you've been. If you're in Jesus, you are holy and blameless and what? Beyond reproach. That is why the devil couldn't harm you. The devil wanted to persecute you. Remember this last week in the passage? And you were given wings the church was given wings to fly in the wilderness and the devil was furious and decided to pour out his own judgment he opened his mouth flood of water came out right and his mouth is what his accusation against you and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up all the water 
because all creation itself knows that Jesus is Lord. That he has made penalty for sins. And that's why verse 23 of Colossians says this, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not move away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. What Jesus has done is proclaim in all creation. And even all creation sings for joy for what Jesus has done, the salvation he has bought for you. The devil has nothing on you, dear beloved. Do you know that you are holy and blameless? And what? Beyond reproach. No one can accuse you of anything. The devil can't accuse you anymore. He tried, he failed. He's still trying to get some of you to believe that his lies are still true. Yes, some of you still hear whispers that you, what you have done will forever haunt you, that you're nothing, and your failures define who you are. But when you do that, it is your choice. Because Jesus has already paid for your sins. When you hear the devil, you run to the cross. So the devil has no power over you. So in order to conquer the church, he needs some help. And he needs some desperate Desperate help. So in this passage this morning, we see that the devil comes to the seashore. Now, the seashore is not, back in the old days, it's not where you go for vacation. The seashore back then was actually a place in the sense of terror. You see, in ancient times, unless you're a mariner, and even if you're a mariner, if you're a sailor, you're afraid of the ocean. Because the sea is where the unknown, where chaos comes from. If you recall back in Genesis, what did God create the earth out of? It says what? Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. Where the Spirit of God is actually mentioned, is actually hovering, is in the sense, is actually keeping back the chaos of the sea. You see, the sea was where there's uh, storms, where there are unknown sea monsters, where they're terrifying, deep, within. I remember when I came to the United States, I was, uh, it was back in 1978, and I lived in Galveston, Texas, right on the Gulf of Mexico. And 1978 or 79 was also when the movie Jaws 2 came out. And I remember that I would go to the ocean, and I would be terrified at whatever monstrosity will be out there. The ocean may look flat, may look even, but I don't know what's underneath the surface. And I was terrified back then if my feet cannot touch the sand. When I'm swimming on the ocean, I never know what's underneath. I can nab you. So I always swim with other people, preferably those who swim slower than me. And the idea here is that the devil needed some help. 
And he needed to call up some monsters from the deep. You will recall, many of you may recall from the book of Job, how at the end of the book of Job, after Job challenged God many times, God finally responded and asked him all these questions which Job cannot answer. He asked him about who hung at the Orion, who hung Pleiades in the sky, how did the planetary motions work, And then God moved to the earth, and he talked about the ostrich. He talked about the donkey. He talked about mountain goats giving birth. And all these questions, Job couldn't answer. And finally, for the pinnacle of his argument, he talked about two beasts. One sounds like it's from the land, the other one from the sea. One's called Behemoth, the other one is called Leviathan. Now, if you read your Bible, many modern commentators and scholars try to say that this Leviathan was a crocodile. But if you read this description of this beast, it's a fire-breathing beast of mythical proportion. It's a gigantic monster. It's a terrifying monster. And this is a picture that's given to us from the book, from here in this beast. Now, what is this beast? This beast is actually, to understand this beast, we have to actually understand what? If you've been following me, to understand the book of Revelation, you really have to understand the rest of the Bible. This beast is actually taken from Daniel chapter 7. Got the answer? I'm proud of you. That's right. Okay, good. Looks into the Old Testament background of this beast. Um, this is from Daniel chapter 7. You have to, Joe, if you're there, can you put the, um, I have this PowerPoint. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then you wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking to my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. Here are four beasts coming up from the sea. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until his wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leper, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, a dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. What's very interesting about this passage is that if you hear that read the description of these four beasts, it is the description of this beast out of the sea. You see this description 
the beast coming out of the sea, he had ten horns and seven heads, and on his heads were ten diadems. On his head were blasphemous names. And this beast which I saw was like a leper. It's described having like a leper. It, um, his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So this is a beast that is a combination of the four beasts that were listed here. And boys, these beasts were like something else you see here. This beast was also a beast that had what it has, seven heads. If you count the heads of the four beasts together, you have the head of a lion, a head of a bear, and where, what's the third beast? The beast of a leper. And the leper had, well, how many heads? Four heads. And the fifth beast, and the fourth beast um, have one head. If you add all these heads together, you have seven heads. Brothers and sisters, and these four beasts represent what? The first beast lion represents Babylon. The second beast, beast, with the bear, represents Mede Persian. Boys, what are you supposed to be talking about there? Mede and Persian. Okay, please turn around. The third beast, Edward, is the leper, which represents Alexander the Great. He had four heads because it was a beast that went to four kingdoms. After Alexander the Great died, his kingdom split into four. And there's the fifth beast, the terrifying beast, the most powerful beast representing Rome. Now, if the devil cannot accuse you, what is the devil going to bring against you? He's going to bring against you all the kingdoms of the world. If he knows that he cannot cause you spiritual accusation, he is going to bring upon you the kingdoms of this world to crush you. He is going to call the kingdom of this world, and I believe that this, these beasts represents state power. I changed the title slightly because I also think that there is some religious power within this beast. Because why? This beast has blasphemous, blasphemous names written on its head. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Throughout most history, Christians have been a minority. We who live in the United States, we have been blessed for the most part from freedom from persecution. For most people of the world, think about Roman Empire, think about most times in China, beyond the Iron Curtain, the church has been persecuted or behind the Islamic world today. And this is how the devil really manifests his power by trying to crush the church. Let's see how he does that. He says this is a beast having ten horns and seven heads. You know, what's very interesting is that this is almost the same description of the devil back in chapter 12. The only difference is that what's flipped is that the first description was seven heads and ten horns. Here is ten horns and seven heads. And what does that mean? I think the horns actually represents power and strength. If you look at the book of Daniel, the ten horns literally represents ten kings. And that's why here... The ten horns have, each one has a crown on his head. If you look at chapter 12 in this description of the devil, it is the seven heads of the devil, seven heads of the serpent, 
that has the crown. So this is actually worldly authority that has actually come to bear down upon you. And even more so, it has here, it says that, and the dragon given his power and his throne and his great authority. You know, it's actually, I think, part of his sarcasm. Because what happened to the devil's authority was actually taken away from him with the reign of Christ. But here, the devil gave him his throne. And this is what it's a copy of. You hear an echo of the father giving Jesus, his son, the throne. And this beast, many have called it, is the Antichrist. You know, what did the Apostle John say to us? You know it's the last hour because what? Many Antichrists, the Antichrist has come, and even now many Antichrists have come. And there is a final Antichrist that is coming, which Paul calls the man of lawlessness. But this is a person where we can say this is the power that wants your worship. In fact, this false beast copies Jesus. What do you see here? Verse 3 tells us that I saw one of his head as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Who died and came back to life? Yes, Evan. Jesus. Absolutely. And here is this beast that's copying Christ. You know, most commentators actually said that this beast, it pretended to die and it actually came back to life. But this, but literally this passage actually says this has one of his head looked like it has been slain. And his fatal wound, the word for fatal there is actually the word plague. The only person who gives out plague in the book of Revelation, in fact, in the entire Bible, is God himself. And I believe that this is actually a beast who actually did suffer a plague from God and should have died, but looked like he came back to life. Brothers and sisters, whose head has been crushed? Whose head has been crushed by Jesus rising from the dead? Whose head has promised to be crushed from back in Genesis 3? Yes, sir. Satan. You only can pay attention. Great, great answers. It's the devil. The devil's head has been crushed. But if you look around today, does it look like the devil's head is crushed? No. It doesn't. And here is the idea, brothers and sisters. The devil is actually defeated. But as you look at this world, it doesn't look that way. And then I would argue with you that this is, in fact, part of God's plan. God has a final victory. And God says in 2 Thessalonians that those who are deceived, they are deceived. God gave them a spirit of deception because what? They do not want to believe the truth. So there is a power out there, there's state power, there's religious power that looked like it should have died, but still living on. 
And brothers and sisters, maybe you think that way today. I was in my Sunday school, and someone's brother, who shall remain nameless, did not come to church because he went to bed too late last night. Actually, there are a couple of them. I said to the boy, I said, you know what today is? Today is actually the most important day of the week because Jesus has conquered death. But more and more in our secular culture, in the culture we live in, we don't make Sundays any different from any day of the week. We have games, soccer games. Did I dare you to say NFL? But we have, we treated every other game, shopping day, as today. Because it looks like Jesus death and resurrection did not put the end to the devil. And the false religion we can have. You see, the devil wants us to turn to him instead of turning to the sun and find healing. The devil gives us chief substitute. You think about entertainment today. You can have catharsis. You can watch a movie. You can feel good. And you can even feel clean by what the hero did. But this is not true cleanseness, cleanness, cleansing that God himself can give us. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with them? You hear in this actual statement again, there's copying of who God is. What's the old refrain in the Old Testament over and over again? Who is what? Like the Lord from the Song of Moses. Here is like who is like the beast. And again, the the devil is trying to get people to worship him. And then there was given to him mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. See, oppressive power is not content. with just controlling. They want to be God. Think of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Think of many dictators. They want to be worshipped. Think of our land. Think of our state. Many of you know that in our, in our state, and we have an 1849 law banning murder of preborn children. And yet our courts, our ge- attorney general refuses to uphold God's law or the law of the land, or God's law protecting the innocent. It's because we want to be law to ourselves. You see, the devil is always going to raise people because they cannot overcome the church. The way to overcome the church is to oppress. Are you? As Christians, that's why we face difficulties. 
That's why in school, maybe you're, you're afraid to talk about your Christian faith. At work, we have to be careful. In different places, we're afraid to stand up for Christ. And look at what it says here in verse 7. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So this beast, the way to overcome the church, is through physical attack. Because the devil realized that spiritual attack accusing you never works again. That's why he sends oppressive power. And that's why, you know, throughout the church history, we all, you know, we face time of persecution. That's why at times, even now here in the United States, there's always the state wanting to take over. This is actually a good place. I didn't think about this earlier. This is actually a good place to talk about spiritual influence given to us. God has created a state for the purpose of what? Romans 13 tells us God's given us the state to what? Keep peace. To provide law and order. And the state is to carry the sword in order to what? Punish wrongdoers. Along with that, they also collect taxes to build up some infrastructures. But what is the temptation of the state? What is the temptation of any man that you give him power? Is anyone ever happy with just power? Everyone wants more power. That's why in some countries, they want to be not just your power, they want to be your health and human services, they want it to be your religion, they want to give you what a promise of life. And that's why God has actually given us, the church. What is the church? The church is given what? To spread the gospel. We are given the keys to the kingdom. What are the keys to the kingdom? To show people how to find eternal life in Christ. That's a responsibility of us. The state cannot tell people how to find eternal life. Only you and I can. God has also given to us a family to bring up the next generation in his godly ways. The state cannot do that, even though the state wants to do that. Oftentimes we forget this. But God has given to us, the church, the power to preach his gospel. And the way the state, the oppressed kingdom power to overcome the church is that they have to conquer them. And then they can cause everyone to worship the state. Think about this world you live in today. If there is no God, we live in a closed system. Who is your savior? Who is going to provide for you? It's a state. And that's why in nations and the communist rules, the state becomes king. 
And that's why in those places, the first place to persecute is actually the church. What are we to do as a church then? Verse 8 tells us that all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, the lamb who has been slain. I love this verse. You know why? Because within this verse is a wonderful promise of God preserving you. John did not just say that your name was written in the book of life. John says that your name was written down from, in the book of life from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. That means that if you're a Christian, when did God choose you? Choose, 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 choose. When did God choose, chose, choose, choose you? Thanks. I had a bad day in church to, uh, Sunday school today. I said when cowboys used to go to salons to have a shootout instead of saloon. So um, when did God choose you? In the foundation of the world. If your name is written in the book of life, when was it written? Before God made anything else. So the idea is this, no matter what happens, God's going to preserve his church. God will preserve his people. And this is a, and this shows that this is written in the foundation book of life of the Lamb who has been slain from the beginning of the world. God planned it. And then John says this, if anyone has a year, let him hear. Who else says this? Yes, heaven is Jesus. If you join us for men's group, you'll hear this. We are talking about the parables. Come join us. You hear the echo of Jesus, and here again, it's a challenge. Remember the parable of the sower? Four seeds, one seed, four different plots of land. Here the Lord is saying, do you have years to hear? And then the Lord says this, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captive, captivity he goes. If anyone's killed with the sword, with their sword he must be killed. Now commentators are debating about this. Some people think that this is a reference to Christians. Other people actually think, and I think they're actually right, is that this is actually a reference to those who are actually unbelievers who ultimately will be killed. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must, he must be killed. And then he says, that, then John says, here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. And the perseverance of the saints is this. Maybe there will be times of great persecution. But what's the worst thing the devil can do to you? Can the devil take away your soul? No. Because what do we say? The devil's accusation against you is like Teflon. It does not stick. The only thing that devil can do is actually put you to death. What did Jesus say at the about the end. He says, he who persevered to the end will be saved. And right before that is that the false Christ will come and they will deceive, try to deceive the elect if possible. Is it possible to deceive the elect, brothers and sisters? Yes or no? No. 
It's not. As terrifying as this monster is, John is saying the worst thing that the world can do is just to bring you closer to Jesus. Because the moment you die, if you're a Christian, you go straight to the Lord. The challenge for us today, this morning, is this. As the devil has sent this beast up, will you be faithful to the Lord? Will you persevere? The devil is spreading all sorts of lies everything. His own God, his own version of marriage, his own definition of what life is, his own way of salvation, his own way of finding cleansing, different religions, different things that throw at you. But you are precious in God's sight. And he has given you ability to stand and persevere. Will you stand for him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, please help us to hear and to understand and to walk faithfully with you. Lord, and thank you, Lord, that we are truly holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So that the devil, all he can do is to bring worldly power against your church. Father, let us be those who stand unashamed of Jesus, your son, for your gospel. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's arise. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's life for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and praise Through death into life everlasting He passed and we follow him there for us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. In the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace, his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. In the things of earth will grow strangely dim, in the light of his glory and grace. In the
the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Let's uh, sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Let us pray. Father, would you please impress upon us the coming of your kingdom, that your kingdom's power is way above any principalities and powers of this world. Forgive us for not believing that. Help us to be a church alive and faithful to you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. After a moment of silent meditation, service will be over.